We'll start with a prayer, and we can start from there. Father God, uh, we come before you this morning thanking you for um, this opportunity to learn more about you and your kingdom. Um, thank you, Lord, for bringing all these people here. We pray that you would open hearts and minds and uh, that you would work through me and um, anything that's not of you, you would cast out and those things that are edifying that you would place uh, deep in our hearts. Thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So like the last three times I've been up here, I didn't bless you with a dad joke. Right? So I know you all are disappointed, right? So I have two today. They're short and simple. So you all want to hear a joke about paper? Now I'll tell you it's terrible. And a winter-themed one. So what did one snowman say to the other snowman? Do you smell carrots? <laughs> so today's topic is God and hell. Light-hearted topic. Um, I feel if we have done our job so far up to this point, we should have given you tools and information to make hell a topic that shouldn't be so daunting um, because we've kind of shown that, that God is a loving God and a caring God and our creator, but also that he's just and holy and the reasons behind those things. So um, I don't have a whole lot wrote down, but I would like to discuss a little bit as we, as we go through it. So uh, hell, uh, what is this place and why does it have to exist? So um, hell is the eternal prison created for Lucifer and the fallen angels. Um, it has to exist because there has to be a place for them to reside or whatever you want to call it <clears throat> uh, once God redeems creation. Um, is it real? And where is it located? Uh, hell is real if the Bible is real. And I believe we've done a pretty good job of uh, proving that the Bible can be trusted. And um, its location is somewhere separated by a great in penetrable, impassable gulf outside of the realm of heaven and the new creation. I mean, we can, and that's beyond our realm of understanding because we just don't get it. We don't know how God's going to do that. Um, in the Bible, though, it talks about that impassable gulf. Um, Hell is a place where the goodness of God is no longer experienced. That should be a terrifying thought. Um, the goodness and control of God is void there. Uh, Satan and the demons will, will experience eternal punishments. They'll experience the untainted, undiluted wrath of God. And according to the severity of the crimes they have committed, in ever-increasing levels of severity, the very highest level and severest punishment, or the lowest level of hell, actually, being reserved for Satan himself. So the, the old time story that uh, Satan rules hell is a myth and non-biblical. Uh, the lowest level of hell is reserved for Satan, and he won't rule from there. Um, so that's what hell is. So people are going to ask, if God is, so, is all-powerful, why is, why is hell even needed? Why not just destroy the unbeliever or the demons? Why is it necessary to punish a person for eternity because they did not believe in God? Which seems a little harsh for a living God, right? Um, 
Well, let's look at why that's necessary. Um, in previous classes, we have discussed that God is the ultimate good and the ultimate love, but also the ultimate justice and the ultimate holiness. And we've discussed how all those things have to be entwined to make each other work between ultimate love, justice, holiness, goodness. Those all have to work together or none of them work at all. Um, so how can we reconcile the concept of, of loving with the idea that if you do not believe in God, that he will send you to a place of eternal punishment? And the Bible describes that place as a place where the worm does not die and the fire never ceases. It's a place where you will gnash or grind your teeth in anger and resentment then you'll, then it's just not going to be pleasant. Um, but I feel the answer to this apparently difficult question is a lot simpler than it may appear at first. Uh, the idea and need for a hell fits both the idea of a loving God and a just God. We have encountered in our previous studies that loving and just God. So when I am talking to a person um, about God and this question comes up, the first thing, the question of why would God send somebody to hell, that's usually the question, right? I'm sure most of you have heard that question. Why does God find it necessary to send anybody to hell? What, um, I've had conversations where people are, why doesn't he just destroy them or soul sleep or um, an eternal destruction to where they just no longer exist? Um, so the first thing I would say is that God is a loving God and that he does not send or pick people to go to hell. Um, those people have made the choice of their own free will to separate themselves from God and the gift of grace he has given to all people. Instead, they have chosen to walk over the crucified body of God's Son, the person of Jesus, the only one to have paid the price of sin, which is death, and an eternal death at that. Basically, people spit in the face of God because their pride will not allow for the need of someone greater than themselves to solve the problem of sin. Instead, they put themselves on the throne and declare themselves God. This attitude is something God cannot and will not tolerate. That still sounds pretty harsh, right? Um, and again, I think back when we were talking about the sovereignty of God, that's a concept that is hard for us to swallow. Am I right? I mean, if you're honest with yourself, the fact that there's somebody that tells you what, that has the right to tell you what to do, regardless of how you feel about it, is hard to swallow. It is for me. Maybe I'm talking to myself. Um, so do we understand that, that that's one of the reasons God needs to have a hell is that he's given you a choice and he's given you a way out of that eternal punishment through Christ. Does that make sense? No? Yeah, but it's a facet of it, sure. Okay, so next, if their argument is that the God they serve is love and would not send his children to hell, then I would say that any parent who truly loves their child, and this includes God, would not force them to spend eternity with them against their will. Um, no person who understands true love would choose to have someone who does not want to be with them forcibly kept in their presence. 
In this case, the only place that does not contain God in the redeemed world, in his perfect love and true respect of the individuals. Free will and God's only remaining choice is access to hell. So once the world is redeemed, there'll only be one place where you won't experience God, and that would be in hell. And so if you've chosen to not accept that gift and that grace, then in his love and respect for your free will, hell is where you're going to be. Um, the Bible says that God does not wish that even one of his children should perish. So that should be encouraging to us, right? That means he's, he doesn't want us to die, and he doesn't want us to die eternally, whatever that means, in hell. And so I, too, do not want my children to be hurt, die, or suffer at all, but they are agents of free will. I can teach my children, show my children, guide them, and punish them. But at some point, they will not be in my care anymore, and they will choose to make decisions that will cost them dearly. Uh, I have done all I can do to parent my children well, not as well as I have wanted, nor the perfect way God parents us, but I have tried. I cannot ultimately prevent my kids from making any harmful or ill-advised choices while saying that I love and respect their decisions. And autonomy. <clears throat> so the only way I could truly stop them would be to take... <laughs> to take their freedom from them and make all their decisions for them, ultimately controlling every aspect of their lives. If I did that, I could not expect them to love me because love has to be a choice, which I have removed from them at this point. I would then say that as a loving parent, that our God, the God of the Bible, has done more than any human parent would ever do for their children, let alone disobedient children. He sacrificed his only child so that there is a way provided for us to avoid the punishment of disobedience and pride. So we do not have to experience the guilt forever. Our crimes can be examined before a righteous and holy God with Christ as our intercessor, and our wrongs in the eyes of God will be forgiven because of the price that has been paid by Jesus. We can have our tears wiped away to never be reminded of them again, having been washed in the blood of Christ and presented as holy and clean in the presence of God. So, is the very existence of hell justified? Why not just take the non-repentant sinner out of existence and never worry about them again? And so God would never have to have a problem with it, right? Um, one reason is that your spirit is immortal. And sure, God could destroy it, but that goes against kind of the character of God. And if he did, would that be justice? Would it be justice to just destroy the immortal spirit? In order for God to remain true to himself, there has to be righteous and holy justice. Or the whole reason of good and love goes away with that, with it. Um, would there be any justice for the pain and suffering Christ went through for the sinner? Because the Bible says he died for all. Or for the soiling of God's creation. If the guilty had to pay nothing for their sins. No, there would be no justice in that. Am I right? Um, we were bought at a cost, and that cost is paid for. That cost was Christ's blood. And, and we pay that cost back 
or is paid back to Christ by being given to Christ in heaven? Um, or is paid back for an eternity with your suffering? And that's sad and terrifying. Um, God demands a price to be paid. Um, in an apologetics realm, if you were talking to somebody about this, this should be a point of pause to let them reflect on that, on that concept that if you've got to the point of hell, or if you've even started with the point of hell, hopefully you've backed up enough to talk about the who God is before you dive into hell, because hell makes no sense without understanding the true attributes of God. Um, Regarding that extinction theory, um, it, it, it helps at times uh, when you're discussing these things to uh, know the background of the person you're discussing it with. That'll help you from help, help your approach in explaining things. And uh, of course, Google is out there uh, uh, too. You can type in what do fill in the blanks believe about hell and there will be articles that come up. And as an example, when I've talked to Adventists, they strongly believe in the extinction theory. And they've been, in their apologetics classes, they've been drilled on scriptures to, to hammer at you staccato style to, uh, that they think proves an extinction theory. So just, just to be aware that there are major denominations that, a few, and it's in a minority, uh, but churches that we would recognize, if, uh, that we would say their names, that do believe that at a certain time after the judgment that the wicked will be extinguished and cease to exist. Um, and, and so this just isn't a theoretical thing. It's something that we'll run into when we talk to people. And so he's saying that there are denominations that believe in a total extinction or eradication or dissolvement of that of your spirit if you have failed to accept Christ. Does that for the new heaven and earth or after you uh, there? This is a long time ago, but uh, well, okay. <coughs> the, the Adventist minister that I lived uh, beside for two years, uh, he and I had a lot of uh, discussions. He, he, he taught that, and I, I truly don't want to speak for them, but this is what was conveyed to me, that they believe in soul sleep at the time of death, that your, you, your consciousness is uh, gone, uh, but at the moment you're resurrected, you suddenly awake, there will be a judgment, the great white throne judgment, and the righteous will go into eternity and the wicked will be extinguished, was the word he used. So, uh, and that's, that's actually two separate things, but soul sleep followed by uh, extinguishment for the wicked. And about that. Soul sleep. Uh, are you asking? Me? <coughs> no, I, 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 I'm not remembering which they, one they, they are. They, but they'll, they'll, yeah. they'll pull a scripture out that says he sleepeth or something, or, you know, and and uh, um, and they they believe this, and, and yet you can you know pull other scriptures like well, the smoke of the <laughs> after he was crucified, and you know uh, that type of thing, and what was he doing preaching to the spirits in hell if he was asleep? And uh, but they've got a special answer for that. But I'm, I'm just saying that as we learn apologetics, it, it's it behooves us to be aware of. Yeah. As a quick aside to that whole conversation, we need to learn exegesis and not eisegesis because what they're using is eisegesis. They're bending the the Bible to their meaning instead of taking the meaning from the Bible. Am I right with that, Jeff? Is that right? Yeah. So 
it's a slippery slope and a very easy thing to get into, the eisegesis. And I know it's a big word, but essentially that's what it means, is you take the Bible's meaning to fit what you want it to mean instead of letting the Bible interpret the Bible. And the Bible does a very good job of interpreting itself if you allow it to. And then there'll be no question. Because you say that and verse after verse comes to my mind of, of that, it is, that it is eternal and forever and that there is no sleep and that there is no <laughs> release from that. So yeah, uh, I understand what you're saying though. That there are people that believe in a soul sleep or I, I've actually, I have relatives that believe in the termination of the soul if you don't accept Christ. And I'm sure if you were to sit down and talk to them and ask them about justice and what they truly believe about justice, if they would feel it was fair for that person to not pay any price for, well, let's just, everybody uses Hitler, let's just use Hitler. For the six million lives that he eradicated because he wanted to for really bad reasons because he just didn't like those people or he had false ideas or whatever it was. If when he died, he just ceased to exist because he took the, again, he took the coward's way out and killed himself, if that's what really happened, then, then where's the justice in that? If he goes up and stands before God and God says, oh, you killed three and a half million of my chosen people, okay, poof, you're gone. I'm happy. No, I don't think so. We wouldn't be happy with that, and we're not holy, righteous, or just. Right? So. So, I really don't have much more. I, like I said, I'm, and I know I kind of read through that quickly, but again, like I said at the beginning, I feel if we've done... Apologetics with, and, and this kind of conversations with people, I know we'd like to think that you could sit down over dinner and get it done, but it's not going to happen over dinner. It'd be a long dinner. Yeah, it'd be a long dinner. Well, here, here's a question. Uh, uh, and, and of course, I'm assuming a lot of things, my interpretation <coughs> as I try to say it or even ask it, and it may be different from others. But, so it is a question. Is, is the state or location of the departed wicked now, which is termed Sheol or sometimes hell uh, in, in the Bible, and, and, and I believe, and I think most everybody else believes it, they're there now. Is that the same place or condition of their eternal place of assignment, and I'm thinking specifically what's been deemed the lake of fire that mm -hmm. Satan and his angels are thrown into. Uh, I, I don't see those as being two, I, I see those things as being either two separate places or a magnification of the present place, uh, like they're going to turn up the heat, so to speak, uh, but are those, are those two conditions and places s separate or equal or... <coughs> So, there's some people in hell right now, I, I think the Bible tells us. The uh, Old Testament guy that hid the idols in his tent, the earth opened up and swallowed him up immediately, right? Alive, so. And it said he went to hell, essentially, to the fires. Is he just going to stay there forever, or is he going to be brought up for the final judgment and then put back there or go somewhere else? I had... Listen to a thing about the difference between Sheol and hell. And Sheol is a holding. Abraham's bosom was another name for that. And it is a holding place until judgment. One of the things I've heard is that when Christ went to hell or whatever, to Sheol and preached the gospel down there, that it was emptied out because there would be no reason for that holding place no more. So in answer to your question, I believe that they're probably in hell. 
Hell is active now. In Revelations, it says hell will be opened, that holding place for those demons, and they'll be released from their prisons. So hell is active because there are demons in hell, in prison, chained up at this moment, waiting for release. So Sheol, I believe Sheol is, was shut down at the cross. That's my personal belief, from what I've read and understand. Yes? Okay, I, I came in a little bit late, so you may have addressed this. <coughs> but what do, you, what do you say to people who say, well, you know, because you said, well, this is their choice. What about people who, who never heard? Romans refutes that thoroughly, and com I feel completely. They have heard. They've heard God's wrote... And God says, you'll be judged on what you know. So you'll know there's a God. You'll know that he's the creator, right? So when you get to heaven, you'll be judged on what you know. Whether you've never heard of Christ or not, God has made himself known to you through what's written on your heart and through his creation, which speaks of his glory. Okay, so you are judged by what you know, but can you be saved by what you know? <laughs> So the Old Testament people didn't, they had an idea of, of a redeemer, but they didn't exactly know Christ. They couldn't call on his name the way we are, able. But it says that their hope in a redeemer, their hope in, in let's just use the word justice, their hope in that through God was enough to be constituted as righteousness for them. So maybe those were the ones that Jesus went to Sheol to preach to? Yeah. The ones that did or didn't follow that tag. But there's been some who died since then. What about them? Uh, will there be a chance for salvation for the person in some African tribe that died yesterday? Who's never heard of Christ? Yes. But I believe the, what the Bible says is that if they have recognized the sovereignty of God, then I think they're okay. Are they in a holding place now as a conscious spirit? Why would they be in a holding place? Well, we're all going, I believe we all go somewhere after we die. Uh, the Bible says when you die, you're immediately in the presence of God. Uh, long enough to be judged and determined where you're going next. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so where, where is the, where is the ignorant cannibal who died yesterday? If that ignorant cannibal followed the laws on his heart and recognized the creation as God's creation, I believe that ignorant cannibal would be in heaven. It, is it too much to to conceive of that just as Jesus preached to the spirits in hell? that Jesus may be preaching to, uh, about 2,000 years ago, that Jesus' presence or manifestation could be being offered to today's modern animals? My, immediately, my immediate question, and I would play devil's advocate for this, is do you have scripture to back that up? Uh, no, I'm just asking a question. <laughs> because if it was fair for the end of Duluth or the, 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 those 2,000 years ago, why wouldn't it be fair today? Because today Christ is, has been, is in the world. That's why I'm... I'm just the, the Bible says that once you, that you'll be held accountable for what you know. And, it, and I'm pretty sure it's pretty clear about, Paul was pretty clear about, you'll be accountable for what you know. If you've heard of Christ and you've poo-pooed that and you've dismissed it, then you're toast for, to, to be jocular about it, which is terrifying to me even at that. If you've never heard of Christ, but, you, but you've followed the laws that God has written on your heart, I don't, in God's justice, he couldn't damn you for not knowing all the information. Yes, yeah, so for like in, like there's an island off of India. Forget what that is. They say you're not supposed to go there, basically. They've been untouched for whatever, thousands of years, you know. I think what you're saying is if they've never heard of anybody, well, God is just and they will go to heaven. Unless those people are on that on that island and have 
and have rejected creation as something greater than themselves and have gone about rejecting the laws that God has written on their heart. If they're cannibals, that probably means they're murderers. Which, in fact, I think that island they killed missionaries that went there just this last year. Correct. Which would be murder. Which would be... Pretty bad. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a... I, I'm just <coughs> saying that I have a, a real difficulty. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I don't, I, I don't understand the scripture that you stated that hell is no more. Uh, I, uh, it, it very well could be. Sheol. Well, is Sheol and hell the same thing? No. Okay. Um, I don't believe Sheol and hell are the same thing. What about Hades? Is Hades the same as hell or Sheol? Hades, and then there's also Tartarus mentioned in the Bible as well. And but I think those, I think, and there is the outer darkness as well. I, I, <laughs> and Gehenna. So, so Sheol, so... <laughs> so Sheol, it, from what I understand, and help me, Jeff, if I if I'm wrong, but she, Sheol, Sheol was before Christ paid the price. Right, everything had to be done with the sacrifice of of animals. Right, so they were there when Christ died. He went to Sheol. It's the Bible says as much. He went down there and he preached the gospel, or he preached the good news, or he went and let them know what had happened. At that point, in one point in the Bible, it says those spirits came out of the grave and were walking the streets for a moment, right? So that that realm was cleared because God, Jesus, let them know what had happened. From that point forward, the, the, the opportunity to go to hell was instant. Does that make sense? Was it was an instant choice at that point? It's either heaven or hell now. There's no more shield. I don't believe there's a shield because those people that have that that honestly believe that God is God, God will do what He needs to do to make sure they get to where they need to be. I think this is a sovereignty issue. Okay, that, that's basically what I was saying. Is isn't it possible that Christ ministers to people as and he did for the shield souls? I can't say that because the Bible doesn't tell me. <laughs> and, and yet, it, it, and, 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 and yet you almost said that in saying that God takes the steps to redeem the redeemable. Yes. Those, those that have not heard of Christ. So, so as, as we're talking through this, and my brain is talking through this, the reality is, is that without some form of redemption and knowing of that redemption, that we all are sinners and we all come short of the glory of God, and that is... Um, punishable by death, right? One second. We're not God. And so in his sovereignty, he's doing what he's doing to what he's, because that's what he does. <laughs> so if you have broken his laws, and Jesus made those laws even more difficult to keep, then then there is no, there's no, you stand before a holy and righteous judge, you're guilty. You go to hell. Does it sound fair? Absolutely not. Uh, it sounds incredibly unfair to me, but I'm not God. I don't make the rules. I know the Bible says that, and, and we can know by knowing who God is, that if those people truly want to follow the laws God has written on their heart and truly want to know the God of the creation that they see, God will make that happen. There are endless stories of, of missionaries 
stumbling through the jungles looking for people to save or people to preach the gospel to and stumbling across villages where those villages have said, oh, the great white person over there has said that you were on their way and that you're going to tell us of how to get to know God. I've read and heard dozens, if not more, stories of that way. Um, <laughs> You're stealing my thunder. <laughs> okay, and then and even in America, that happened with the American Indians, and I can't remember his name, but a little a little man who had tuberculosis went out to the American Indians and preached and prayed for them until he died, essentially, in John Wesley's house, I believe. Brainerd. Is it, what's his first name? David Brainerd. And, and those Indians as well. Oh, you were the one that the Great Spirit has said is coming to tell us what it is we're missing, essentially. So to answer your question, succinctly. If you're honestly, truly seeking God, God will find a way to get somebody to tell you that the price for your sins has been paid. If you're not honestly seeking God, your judgment is, is everlasting hell. I think it's, and, and I, it sounds super harsh, but that's what the Bible, I believe, tells me. Jeff. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to say, well, can, with that eternity, can you speak to, I guess, David that Carr's kind of argument about the translation of eternity is not, shouldn't have been eternity, but should have been age, like, of the, like, as a, what has been translated as eternally, and how it just it was meant to be uh, for the age, and an and age, there were different ages. Uh, and I, I just don't know, but I just know that that's the thing. You mean so? So like, if people are saying, he, he says that His argument, the yeah. word we, the Greek word we translate eternity, just means a, like a limited amount of time. So hell is sort of remedial, like yeah, that. I, you, I eventually, everybody will be punished. Well, not everybody, but those who have not chosen Christ will be punished. But then they will eventually be redeemed. Uh, after that age, that that is that the argument you're. Yeah, I think that's what his argument is, and just I haven't, I just haven't heard me. I've heard some. Yeah, all I've heard is just the, I think it's the tradition, which yeah it is, but I just didn't know. If there yeah, was any I mean, bad I've, I've also heard this. Just no, that's a bad translation. Age is a bad translation okay. too. Like it, so, sometimes it'll mean age, and sometimes it'll mean eternity. Right. And if you just use it all to mean age, you're kind of simple oversimplifying that evident. I think you said there are demons in hell now. Mm -hmm. How did they get there ahead of schedule? Because I would really <laughs> like all of them heading that way today. Very well, I have one question then. What would be the point of the Great White Throne? If people are already sent to where they're supposed to go, <laughs> you know, then what would be the point of the Great White Throne? That'd be another question. The, the great white throne, of, I believe that's going to be a judgment in front of all. I think that's what that is. I don't know. It's, it's a, this is where he separates, the, is that not where he separates the sheep from the goats at the great white throne? Is that another judgment? I think that's another judgment. And there's the Bema seat judgment too. <laughs> We just studied Revelation, and in our study, we came to the conclusion that there's hell, and there is the lake of fire, and that they are two different places, and that um, Satan's going to be bound, he's going to be thrown into the abyss, that's not the lake of fire and stays there for a thousand years, then he is judged and he is thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity. Oh. 
I suppose we could follow Dante's, and those are just separate levels of hell. I, I don't know that there's enough evidence to, to fully determine that the, they're separate places. So how are some demons there already? That's where God put them. And why did they get I mean, how, how did we get rid of them ahead of time? And we saw all so, the so when Christ was casting demons out, especially the Gadarene ones, they were like, please do don't send us to the dry and arid places. Send us to another, another animal or another creature. I don't know that we know exactly what the dry and arid place is, but it sounds hot, right? Um, probably hell. So if they're not sent somewhere else, then they're going to hell. God sent those, what? That, that's not enough scriptural evidence for me to grasp onto. It, it, and it's okay to speculate a little bit. Uh, we, you know, we all wonder about things, but is there a scripture that says the, there are some demons chained in hell now? Revelations. Yes, there is, and I don't know where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> Except yeah, I think we studied that in Revelation. It's in Revelation. I don't know if it's in the book of Revelation or well, if it was yeah, a cross-reference, but God did not allow all the demons to be here tormenting us or this place would be a way a lot worse than it is. Okay, so some of them have always been I'm trying to understand. Yes. Some of them have always been chained there, but some of them have been loosed yes. for, for the time here. Yes. Um, okay, well that I can sort of understand that. Maybe the worst of the worst got chained there. Except for Satan and he's yeah, the worst well, of yeah. Um, if we pray to uh, have our demons bound and sent to the dry places, does that mean that those demons go to go to hell? I don't know. Could she repeat that? I'm sorry. She said if she prays that the demons, that her personal demons, and if you're saved, you would have you would have tormentors. You wouldn't have any personal ones. They should not have any right or place with you. Um. But if you're praying that those things be cast out, um, the way I've been taught and I pray about that is, is I leave that up to Christ. I pray that Christ sends them where he will send them. That's not my place. Um, the Bible is very clear that you need to be very aware that the, at this point in, in your existence, the angels and demons are above you and have more authority than you do. And that you're not to go around um, belittling that authority. It's a dangerous, a dangerous place to be. We do, but that's the that's the authority you call on. Yeah. I guess, I guess maybe I took that a little bit wrong. When you, like, oh my God, if demons are above me, I should be afraid. Uh, I'm you you should. There should be a respect, not a fear. But where do they go when we, uh, when we... I can't answer that question. I don't know. There's um, something that I think about a lot, actually. And when people ask, well, what about this? What about this? It's like, well, we're not omniscient. There's no way that we can understand the judgments of God because he can know everything fully. And we just have to trust that he's completely loving and completely just. And he has this, and you know, our part isn't to figure out who goes where and what, but God's revealed a spiritual reality to us that is so real. If we even know how real it is, we'd be kind of terrified a lot of the time. But he's covered us in his love, and our trust has to be in his right judgments. But this is an apologetics class, and people ask us these questions, so I know, but that's need a where reasonable I, answer. Yeah. And, and I think the reasonable answer for hell is that there has to be a place where justice is meted out. Yeah. Without, a, without a question, with, if God is not just and he doesn't have a place where punishment is, is done, and, yeah. and just dismissing somebody from the scenario is not justice, no. there's no price paid. Right? That person doesn't suffer. People can really understand that. And God's given us enough in his word 
So just the more we know the word, but someone who doesn't trust the word, you know, I mean, they'll probably never be satisfied. And that's not your problem. I have a question. This, this is sort of turning back, I guess, maybe. But all these different words that are used in the Bible, Sheol and Hell and Hades and Abyss and so on and so forth, uh, in the original language, were all of these different words? I think... Or was it translated in a different manner? They're different words. They're all different words. Yeah. Some of them are Greek. Some of them are Greek words from, like, Greek tragedies, and some of them are the old Hebrew words, and one of them, the Gehenna that Jeff mentioned, that's still used there today. That's the dump that where they go and take their garbage and their and stuff and burn it. We shouldn't be surprised, possibly then, if these are actual different places. Sure. I mean, God would have no problem with it, obviously. Right. But we would probably. So we shouldn't be surprised, really. If is talk, if the Bible is speaking of different locations, actually. Uh, different locations or different levels or different, different types? Different and that's another thing I want to say. We don't hear much teaching about, for instance, in heaven, how we'll have different jewels in our crown or whatever. We don't hear much teaching about that, but I do believe it is in the Bible. And I also believe that there's something about, but I may be wrong, and you Bible scholars can correct me, that Hell is not, in other words, you said levels. I don't think that, I mean, I don't know. Is everybody going to have the same amount or type or degree of punishment? I guess that's my question. I, I don't, don't know. It's, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's an up and down concept. I think what, I don't even know if we ever addressed heaven in this class. If we did, it was just passing, but. Heaven, the one thing that, that I find slightly annoying is most people think that when, you know, we die and we're in the presence of God and we're in heaven, that that's where we stay. But that's, that in itself is a holding, a holding place until God redeems um, his creation, at which point we'll all get glorified bodies and we'll live back on, whether it's earth or second level earth or earth 2.0 or whatever it is but we'll be back here as humans working living interacting doing what we do but in the way it was initially intended no at the end the thousand years the thousand years is this earth under the rule and reign of christ yeah. right after that satan is released from his prison unchained and gathers, again, gathers humans and their brokenness to him. They raise up arms against Christ and his rule and reign, and God annihilates them along with the rest of creation. Rhea does it and puts us all back here. I, think I have heard and had discussion in, in scripture about what you measure out or we measure back to you and discussing you know, the levels of punishment or the jewels in your crown in heaven that that's part of the throne is that he's going to look at okay you're a good Christian and this is how good you were so this is what you get it also says you cast those thrones back at the feet of Christ too or those crowns so um, and from my background I am kind of and I probably shouldn't be, but from my background where I come from, I'm a little wary of that what you put out, you get back mentality because that leads, that leads us to believe that, that we have the ability to manipulate our future or, or, or how things. Those, go ahead. Can I say something? I, th I think there's this, um, you know, if you read 
uh, somebody mentioned Dante, you know, and he's got levels of hell and levels of heaven and levels of purgatory. And it's, you know, it's not like a perfect, and it wasn't meant to be a literal picture of heaven and hell, but there's this great passage at the beginning of the paradise where he's going into heaven and he's at like the lowest level of heaven. So as far away as from God as you can get, well, but still in heaven. And he asks these people, are you actually happy here being at the lowest level of heaven? And they, they explain to him, pure happiness is ultimate submission to the will of God. And if God willed that I should be at this place in heaven, then I'm perfectly happy. I'm still in heaven, you know, but uh, I, 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 I'm where God wants me to be. And that's, that's, what, that's what perfect happiness, that's what perfect blessedness is. So it's not like if you're in heaven and you're, you, know, you have fewer jewels in your crown, then you're less happy. Um, because you're where God has ordained you and wanted you to be, and that that that's that's part of what that that's ultimately what happiness is. I think that that's a good way of looking at it, not as maybe a literal picture of jewels in your crown, but as, um, you may not be you may not you know. You'll be satisfied with the yeah, no, the no, the sovereignty of God. So, yeah, you there will be no jealousy. In hell, in heaven, there will be in hell. <laughs> Every, right, God's justice and sovereignty and will will have been done, and there will be no questions. That's that's our job here, in this realm, and that's what causes us so much heartache and pain is to question so much. So back to the salvation deal that I guess they really even started off with, you know the. The people who have never heard, and I think we already covered that, but what about, say, Jews, current day Jews that they have heard, but they kind of, I guess, maybe in their culture, their rabbis or whatever, kind of just stigmatize Christianity and they never really look into it. And they, they do continue to follow the old traditions. They, did they miss the mark, or are they still... Are they following the old traditions or are they following the new tradition, the new old traditions? Are they sacrificing animals like they were told to? They don't. They can't. There is actually, we were just reading about it this week. There is a group, there are several groups of Jews and Yazidis and others, the Jewish, that are sacrificing animals. So how does that complicate the issue? It, they still are missing the point. God. But, you just said, but, you, you, but you've also said that they who are doing the best they can under the light that they're given or the culture that they're given, that they're going to go to heaven. I've heard that today. But I also said that if you're doing that under false precepts, if you're doing that because you feel that's the right thing to do, that's not good enough. I've heard you say that today. I did. Those but for also, those who have not heard, heard right? Him. The, the, the Israelites are without any excuse. And I'm pretty sure the Bible says that. Is that they're without excuse because they knew that Christ was coming as a redeemer and as a suffering servant 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Well, yeah, was... And they still have those scriptures. And in, in, uh, in the uh, Lazarus and the rich man, um, Abraham says... You know, if they won't listen to Abraham, if they won't listen to the prophets, then they're not going to listen to anybody else. What if the rabbi just tells you Jesus is bad and that was it? <laughs> they have the ability to read. This is also the topic for next week, by the way. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> is, is Jesus the only way to heaven and the different religions? That's, that's what we'll be talking about next week, too.